Hello there, my name is Dr. Declan Kavanagh and I teach English literature at the University of Kent in the School of English. And in this lecture, I'm going to talk to you about the essay. So here's just a brief plan of what I'll be discussing over the next, oh, I'd say 30 minutes or so. So we'll think a bit about the 18th century origins of the essay. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the essay in some form or another, be it a critical research essay or a creative essay. So we'll think about the 18th century origins of the essay. We'll briefly sample some quotations from essays from the 18th century, such as Joseph Addison and Richard Steele's The Spectator, which is a publication I'm going to be talking a bit about, and its dates are 1711 to 1712, and a brief revival in 1714. And then we'll turn to a more recent essay from one of my favourite contemporary authors, Zadie Smith, and we'll be thinking about her essay, Meet Justin Bieber, from her collection Feel Free from 2018. And we'll be thinking about Smith's essay really to help us think through how the 18th century periodical essay has shaped contemporary essay writing. Okay, so that's, that's the plan. That's what we're going to be doing. It would be useful if you have uh, time to maybe read Zadie Smith's Meet Justin Bieber uh, essay. And it will give you a good sense uh, of what I'm going to be talking about later on in, in this uh, lecture discussion slash podcast. Um, but, you know, there's no requirement to do that. I think it's a great essay. Uh, you may have even read it before, uh, but, uh, but it's entirely up to you. OK, so let's let's begin. So it's always useful, I think, uh, and you'll find this when you come to study English here with us at Kent, when we think about a literary form, such as the essay, it's always good to think about definitions. And, you know, as a starting point, what is the definition of the essay? So I've pulled some up uh, from Merriam Webster. And I also have just a picture of the frontispiece, piece. Uh, I'll say that again, frontispiece, which is the front page of uh, the female spectator, uh, which is another periodical from the 18th century. And you can kind of make out some of the detail in, in that. So, okay, definitions. So an essay, an analytic or interpretive literary composition, usually dealing with its subject from a limited or personal point of view. Okay, think about that. So analytic, so there's an interpretation analysis. Uh, it's a literary comp composition, so there's craft that goes into that. There's form. Form as in there is a kind of form for this uh, piece of work. We need to think about what has come before and what an essay looks like has been shaped by that and usually dealing with its subject from a limited or personal point of view. And that's true, I suppose, of the critical essay, the research essay, because when you're writing your research essay, uh, and you'll be doing some of that work at, at Kent, you are coming to the material from a, a personal point of view, but it's one that's informed by what others have said about the topic. Um, and then the, the creative essay is from a, a personal view, but it's also often from the view of a constructed narrative persona, which can be quite, quite limited as well. So there's a lot in that definition. Let's just keep that kind of in our minds. And then the second definition of the essay, which I love because it's been forgotten. It's been really forgotten. An essay means an effort or an attempt to essay means to attempt something. And it's kind of inbuilt, isn't it, into the essay as a form. It, the essay is an attempt to bring often meaning to a topic, to explore a topic, or to get 
across the self, that illusionary, um, mysterious thing that we call the self, the, the depths of which have been, you know, um, plumbed by philosophy, psychoanalysis, um, film, TV, uh, the podcast form even. So it's about getting across something or attempting to get across something. Right, so there's some definitions. I'd like you to think about, you know, what definition did you have before this? How does it fit in with, with what I'm presenting here? And have you even thought about what the essay might mean before? These are all things to kind of keep in mind. Okay, so the origins of the essay, as we understand the essay today, come from what we call the periodical essay in the 18th century. Okay, so periodical means in this context, published at regular intervals. So as an essay or essays that were published uh, sing in singularly or together uh, every Friday or every Thursday or weekly or bi-weekly or whatever, published at regular intervals. That's what periodical means. Now, the 18th century is the period that I am invested in, in terms of my research here at the University of Kent. I research 18th century literature from queer perspectives, uh, from gender perspectives, and I'm increasingly interested in the, the history and the literary history of disability. And I'm interested in thinking about the 18th century from those points of view. And um, the 18th century is dated uh, for our purposes as occurring anywhere between 1680 and 1780. And I'm talking about the Anglophone 18th century. So uh, writing in English during that period. And it's an incredibly important period for the study of English literature. Okay, the periodical essay in Britain uh, emerges during this period, uh, the early 18th century. And it really reflects a moment when literature was less sharply distinguished from other forms of writing, such as journalism, philosophical speculation, private memoirs, and letters, travel narrative, and sermons. Now that is a quote from Denise um, Gigante, the, uh, from a book known as The Great Age of the English Essay, an anthology uh, from Yale published in 2008. And uh, Denise uh, Gigante uh, is talking here about the periodical essay coming at a time when literature itself was kind of less defined than it is now. We all go into a bookshop and, and we look and we see different sections, contemporary, classical, um, you know, children's literature, young adult fiction. We sort of have categorized literature in all sorts of ways, nonfiction and so on. The novel as a thing. Well, in the 18th century, uh, you know, we start without a novel really as a thing. And by the end, we have Jane Austen. So the 18th century really is a time in which the novel is on the rise as a literary form and writers are helping to shape and determine what that means. What does the novel mean and what can it mean? So the essay really comes out of that and sort of precedes and informs uh, the rise of the novel. And I'll be speaking more about that uh, as we go on. It's enough to know now that the 18th century in terms of literature is a kind of, uh, I suppose, period in which literature as we know it is information and sort of, you know, kind of in flux. The periodical essay uh, tradition offered a peculiar opportunity though for those who began to write essays and write regular essays and, and publish them in this period. And the opportunity was really one for the author to create a character and really more nearly a pose or persona that participated directly in the public sphere, in public life, thereby becoming something more than a fictional character. So the kinds of characters or narrative personas that we find in periodical essays 
are fictional, but often pretend to be real. And, you know, there's a pose that is sort of presented in this work that the, the narrative persona, i.e. the person who is meant to be writing the essay, is a real person, is involved in public life, is somebody who you could meet on the street, basically. And that's, that's quite interesting. And it's interesting for all sorts of, um, I suppose, uh, reasons. But one is celebrity, thinking about the history of celebrity, which I'll get on to. Um, and also the, the history of uh, characters, literary characters, and um, how characterization became so central to the novel as a form, and how this started in periodical essays. So the period, periodical essay becomes the literary space where real life narrative personas are first tested out. And as I said, this goes on to influence the novel. So the 18th century essay that uh, I want us to kind of think through uh, today is from The Spectator. And in The Spectator, which is a periodical um, essay publication, um, the authors construct a narrative persona. So the narrative persona in The Spectator is Mr. Spectator. Mr. Spectator narrates the spectator. And this was a kind of new sort of um, thing because this publication really demanded no prior specialist knowledge for the reader. So readers did not have to be you know, well-versed in philosophy or history or politics or really very educated to understand any you know, given essay in The Spectator. Uh, so this was a new thing because really in the 18th century and earlier, it's really a select few group of men who, who are educated or get to be what's called educated. And more men can read than, than, than women uh, in this period. And, it, you know, the kinds of material that are available are often, you know, specialist, uh, you know, philosophical, uh, maybe religious, um, you know, uh, kind of materials. Um, and there is a kind of an exclusionary sort of ring around uh, what, what's perceived as, 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 as literature. However, the birth of the periodical essay really opens up this space and opens up reading to people, to, uh, you know, kind of demographics that wouldn't normally have had occasion to engage in um, literature in this, in this way. So it demands no real kind of specialist knowledge or education, and therefore it opens up reading. Uh, the essays are usually dated and signed from a particular place, usually a coffee house. So coffee drinking and coffee culture is very big in the 18th century. Uh, coffee houses spring up all across London from the end of the 17th century right through to the 18th century. The coffee house becomes a place for for people to meet and to discuss and to think about politics and debate, um, you know, issues that are affecting uh, them and to think about, um, you know, um, I suppose, you know, non-religious kind of secular issues, you know, a place to, to engage in culture and to be sort of cultured. And the essay, the periodical essay in this time reflects those sorts of conversations because it's conversational in tone. It moves from personal reflection to social critique and, and back again. So these essayists in the 18th century addressed readers also as confidants. They didn't address them as sort of fools or people who you know, couldn't uh, understand what, uh, what they were saying or, you know, or, or needed a, a particular kind of education in order to uh, be involved. They didn't, they didn't uh, kind of, you know, do that. They were, they were very, I suppose they were very sort of, you know, lowbrow, if that, if that, if that makes sense. Um, and they addressed readers as confidants. 
developing an intimacy in order to persuade them on issues such as taste, philosophy, aesthetics, and politics. So kind of really sort of subtly trying to condition people. There was something mm, pro propagandist about, about the early essay as well in the hands of men like Joseph Addison and Richard Steele, uh, who wrote the, wrote the Spectator. So let's look at the Spectator number one, uh, the first issue and the opening. I have observed that a reader seldom peruses a book with pleasure till he knows whether the writer of it be a black or fair man, that's about hair colour, or mild or choleric disposition, that's about health and a kind of early modern view of the body as being made up of humorous fluids. Married or a bachelor, you know what that's about. With other particulars of the like nature that conduce very much the right understanding of an author. I have passed my latter years in this city, London, where I am frequently seen in most public places, though there are not above half a dozen of my select friends who know me. Thus, I live in the world rather as a spectator of mankind than as one of the species. Okay, so there's something really interesting going on here about uh, the opening of the spectator and this narrative persona of Mr. Spectator. Because Mr. Spectator is kind of saying here, I know that readers want to know who I am, but I'm not really going to tell them. He's saying, I've passed my latter years in the city. I'm seen, you've probably seen me, um, but nobody really knows me. There are not half a dozen of my select friends who know me. Thus, I live in the world rather as a spectator of mankind than as one of the species. So in other words, in this publication, I might write about you. I might have seen you, I might have noticed you, or someone like you, and I'll have something to say. But I fade into the background. I'm there, but I'm not there. So Mr. Spectator is a silent but social agent, a fictional persona posing as a real person. And this is a really clever narrative persona. If you're writing an essay, that's sort of about contemporary issues, about people, about politics, about London life, but you're sort of, you know, uh, you're not kind of giving any reader uh, any sort of, um, I suppose, way of knowing who you are. You're like a blank canvas for them to project their own fantasies, their own ideas onto. Mr. Spectator is everywhere but nowhere, in coffee houses observing and documenting what he sees. And the implication is that a person's behavior, as I said, might be recorded and praised or mocked, ridiculed. 18th century coffee house goers read or listened to readings because not everybody was literate. Um, they read or listened to readings of the spectator. And in a circular way, Mr. Spectator produced the very coffeehouse conversation that he purported to represent. Because people in the coffeehouse read the periodical essay, read what Mr. Spectator was saying they were saying in the coffeehouse, and then they ended up saying it because they were talking about what Mr. Spectator had wrote. That's a bit of a circular kind of way around that. You might have to kind of think about that for a while, but it was a self-fulfilling sort of, I suppose, enterprise. Mr. Spectator subtly persuaded readers towards accepting particular political ideas. So there's something here about the essay being a vehicle, even in its earliest you know, manifestation, a vehicle for political persuasion. And Joseph Addison and Richard Steele, you know, had that political persuasion embedded in, you know, the essay, the various essays, but they also wrote a blend of journalism, cultural commentary, philosophical musings, uh, even on topics, you know, of the day that were quite, you know, hot topics like the imagination and, the, you know, what, what is the imagination, what, what are its limits and so on. 
So it wasn't just kind of heavy, you know, uh, political, you know, uh, opinion. It was more subtle than that. Okay. So what does this really um, mean then uh, for, for the essay? The unique narrative style and focus of periodicals like The Spectator emerged in the early 18th century, but did not survive long into uh, the 19th century. Readers became less interested in urbane wit and more interested in authentic or romantic selfhood. So the kind of selfhood that Mr. Spectator is uh, projecting is sort of empty. And when the romantic period happens and there is a kind of development of the self in that period that is bound up with authenticity and so on, this becomes less fashionable. If you come to us here in uh, the School of English to study at Kent, and I very much hope you will, you will have the opportunity to write research or creative essays along with other innovative assessments such as podcast making, documentary making, and um, screenplay writing and so on. But the research or the creative essay is a form that you will be grappling with on some level at some point during your degree. And both of these forms can be traced back to the spectator. The spectator's focus on constructing an intimate and real narrative persona influenced the novel and what we call creative writing practices today. Meanwhile, Mr. Spectator's penchant for taste in literary and aesthetic matters provides us with the basis for what would eventually become English literary criticism. So when Mr. Spectator is dissing a play that is on in you know, London at the time, or you know, dissing a, a, a literary work, uh, there is the, the germs of English literary criticism before English literature becomes a sort of formalized discipline that happens later on in the, the 19th century. But there's the beginnings of that kind of criticality in essays such as uh, The Spectator. Okay, so that's the 18th century. Let's just jump into the present and think about the contemporary essay. One of my favorite contemporary essays is by the author who I admire, well, incredibly admire, Zadie Smith. And it's from her collection from 2018 entitled Feel Free, which just sounds lovely, doesn't it? <laughs> in days like, like today, coming out of lockdown, uh, hopefully in a couple of weeks, this idea of feeling free is, is yeah, is, is lovely. So I give that feeling to you now and maybe, you know, hold on to it and see what you can do with it. Feel free. OK, that aside, in this collection, she writes an essay about Justin Bieber. And the picture of Justin Bieber that I put up there is, well, it doesn't really look like Justin Bieber anymore because Justin Bieber's looks change all the time. Um, and that is part of the unknowability of Justin Bieber, which is a topic of the essay that Zadie Smith writes. So this is a quote from the essay, Meet Justin Bieber. I'm not on Twitter, but quite often I find myself thinking of Justin Bieber. It's not a sexual interest. At least I don't think it is. It's more of a, bear with me, philosophical interest. I used to have a similar preoccupation with the teenage Michael Jackson. Basically, what's it like to be such a person? What does it feel like? Does it still feel like being a person? If you meet Justin Bieber, would he be able to tell you? So I'm very interested in this essay by Sadie Smith because in posing these questions about Justin Bieber, She's posing broader questions about the nature of the self. What is it to be a self that is modern or contemporary? What is it to be a self in our current age? What is it like to be such a person, a celebrity? What does it feel like? 
what does it still feel like being a person? So these are very interesting questions and it interests me as a researcher of 18th century literature that Zadie Smith, a contemporary author, is posing these questions in an essay because the origins of the essay form, as we've discussed, really are bound up with these questions of the self, of selfhood. And Mr. Spectator posing as a self, the beginning of Mr. Spectator's first essay, if we can just go back quickly, acknowledges these questions. I have observed that a reader seldom peruses a book with pleasure till he knows whether the writer of it be a black or fair man of mild or choleric disposition, married and so on and so on. In other words, a reader reading an essay is on a quest to understand the author, but to understand in a more broader sense, this, this question of selfhood. What is the self that is bound up with the pleasures of reading, probably bound up with why you want to study English literature? It is a worthy topic to pursue. It is a topic that people have spent many lifetimes pursuing. What is the self? It is a topic that is ongoing since the 18th century and the contemporary. And the essay is the form in which the self is explored. And here Zadie Smith is exploring this celebrity self of Justin Bieber. Can we ever meet Justin Bieber might also be posed as can we ever meet ourselves? Can we ever know ourselves? Zadie Smith in her essay raises the question of persona and draws upon the philosophy of Martin Buber to think through a fan's meeting with Justin Bieber at an autograph signing. And she makes a joke that Martin Buber sounds like Justin Bieber. I don't think it's a very funny joke, but you know, that's just part of the essay, isn't it? Maybe you found it funny, I don't know. This is what she says. So now I think again of a believer in the Justin Bieber signing queue. She is lining up for an experience, an experience which even as it is happening, seems to be relegated to the past tense, as in, I just held his hand. He just hugged me. I just met Justin Bieber. Not only is this meeting always already a story, it only really exists as narrative. And it's because Bieber is Bieber that we can see this so clearly. It's obvious that a believer's only relation to the globally famous Bieber is a piece of narrative to be told and retold to herself or himself, to other people, and that Bieber himself in his human reality is barely involved, almost unnecessary. So there's a lot in this quote and in a seminar, if we were you know, chatting about this, we would be going through this quote, we would be thinking about what Smith is saying here really is so much bigger than Justin Bieber. And Justin Bieber is kind of the occasion for this broader conversation about the philosophy of encounter and the philosophy of the self and how it is that we can meet somebody and not meet them and how it is that a meeting with a celebrity, be it Justin Bieber or whoever, I don't know, who's famous now, Billie Eilish, I, I don't know, I'm old, um, but whoever is, you know, the celebrity of the moment, meeting them is always trapped in narrative and can only really be a narrative to be told and retold. That really, that celebrity is a persona. And beyond that, their human reality 
is really unknown or barely involved in that process of encounter. Zadie Smith's essay, Meet Justin Bieber, heavily draws upon the 18th century periodical essay tradition, which also implicitly you know, queries the legacies of narrative personas like Mr. Spectator. Smith raises interesting questions about Bieber's celebrity persona, his beginning and ending in narrative. We can never meet Justin Bieber because the Bieber that we know is simply a constructed narrative persona. He is as unknowable as the fictitious narrative persona of the spectator, Mr. Spectator. And in this moment as well, there's a broader question here about celebrity. And can the origins of celebrity be traced back to the literary form of the essay and to narrative personas like Mr. Spectator? And the answer is yes. Um, more to follow uh, if, if you come to Kent <laughs> and, and study uh, here. These are, these are big, big questions. Smith also uses intimacy in her own essay. Humor, you know, kind of admitting, I don't fancy Justin Bieber, or maybe I do, or whatever, like kind of intimacy. Accessible philosophical musings, personal reflections and social critiques. And she does all of this in a way that mirrors the 18th century writers that we discussed earlier. And here's the thing, although she invites us into a private space, in telling us that we will never know the real Justin Bieber, she is also saying that we will never know the real Zadie Smith, a move that has Mr. Spectator written all over it. In the School of English at Kent, you will have the opportunity to learn more about the origins of the essay, as well as other forms like the novel on the second year course EN 681 Novelty, Enlightenment, Emancipation, 18th Century Literature. And I teach this course along with some wonderful colleagues, such as Dr. Jenny de Placidi, Dr. Michael Falk, and Professor Jenny Batchelor. So we would love to have you with us to study on that module and to think more about these questions of selfhood, of writing and of um, form. Something that we do a lot uh, on EN681 and other modules is, you know, thinking, always thinking about how the shape of earlier literary forms influences our present writing. So how does the, the early form of the essay influence our present kind of understanding of what the essay is or, or could be? Bringing the um, 18th century and the contemporary together. That's a, that's a strong part of how I teach um, this material. And I hope after listening to this, you might be writing an essay at the moment, you might be dreading writing an essay, I don't know, and um, you might be enjoying writing an essay, depending on what it's about, depending on how close the deadline is, depending on how prepared you feel. But what I would hope you would be thinking about now is the power of the essay form, the ways in which it has developed and the ways in which it has been used to shape culture, to shape how we even think about ourselves as humans, as individuals, as selves, I suppose. Thank you for listening.